people love water. They always have and they always will. The Okanagan Indians are a salmon people. Historically, fisheries and water managers were in an adversarial relationship. Nothing's going to happen because we haven't done anything. We've just talked about it. Without water, we have absolutely nothing. There will be challenges ahead that we'll all have to face. All humans have a connection with water. We are bound by it in more ways than we sometimes realize. Good afternoon to everyone joining us on this live Facebook stream across the country. Welcome to the 2020 final for the first ever British Columbia Aqua Hacking Challenge. My name is Aidan Matrick, co-founder of Aqua Hacking and host of the Aqua Hacking podcast. And it's my pleasure to host this event and to be your MC today. Thank you to everyone for joining us online. The goal of the Aqua Hacking Challenge is to provide a collaborative space to initiate dialogue across sectors, jurisdictions, and generations on issues related to water for water engaged people. We also want to foster an environment conducive to the development of innovative and entrepreneurial tech or engineering solutions to tackle water related issues for the benefit of everyone. It's going to be an exciting afternoon showcasing new solutions for water issues and culminating in the awarding of some major prizes for our final five teams. Not only do we get to make connections, build partnerships, and hear from speakers who are dedicated to protecting water and the environment, but we also get to support the creation of real, technical, and innovative solutions that will help turn these dreams we share into reality. Although today marks the final event of the BC 2020 Aqua Hacking Challenge, it's not the end of the journey for any of our five teams. All of these teams will have the opportunity to participate in a business incubator, taking their ideas and turning them into new startup businesses. Before we get to the teams and the prizes, I would like to invite everyone to acknowledge the traditional territory from which you're joining us today. I'm joining from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam Nations, also known as Vancouver. And as the host organization for the challenge, the Okanagan Basin Water Board is based in the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan Nation. I would like to ask Silks Knowledge Keeper, Richard Armstrong, to offer welcoming remarks and give us the territorial acknowledgement. Hello to the youth of the Aquahack team. It's my pleasure today to ask the creator to put his hand on the hard work that you folks are doing towards making sure that our waters are clean and pure and healthy again. For so many years, our waters were never taken care of, and it's the hard work of the youth of today, like you folks, that have the engineering, the water study, the hydrology, the science behind all of the important things that you're going to need, understanding the flooding, what causes that? Why is the water not clear? Why is the water not pure? All of those things, not only in the valley bottoms, the work that you folks are doing clear to the headwaters, where that drop of pure, clean water comes from. It's those little drops of pure, clean water that make the mighty Columbia that make the Thompson, the Okanagan, and the Fraser Rivers, all of those mighty rivers that take care of the land. And now it's such an honor for me to offer words of encouragement for you, the youth that's taking on this challenge to look at what you can do to make the water good, 
clean, clear, and usable. For many years, people that looked at the water weren't looking at it like the way you're looking at it now to make it pure, clean, pure, and usable. It was just the abuse of the water and how to uh, dirty it up and not take care of it. It touches my heart to hear that Great minds like the Aquahack youth that's working towards taking care of something so important. That water that you're looking at is the lifeblood of every living thing on this earth. There's nothing that alive that can go without it. That water is that important, and it's so good for me to ask the Creator to help what you are doing. Kolnchotn, kon kon da mestmentin, is kol at hoyams it ka kaustn silke youth that sikel aqua hack team. Ich <laughs> Thank you, Aquahack team, for what you're doing. It's an honor for me to offer this prayer in words of encouragement. Thank you, Richard, for both your welcoming remarks today and for the guidance that you gave the teams during their journey by introducing them to the traditional knowledge of Okanagan water. As we go through this event, we encourage you to be active on social media. Comment on this Facebook Live event and share your aquahacking experience on your favorite social media platforms. Use our hashtag aquahacking and mention us at aquahacking and at OKWaterWise. Okay I would now like to welcome the Executive Director of the Okanagan Basin Water Board, host of the British Columbia Aquahacking Challenge, to make some opening remarks. Please welcome Anna Warwick Sears. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here for the finale of the BC 2020 Aqua Hacking Challenge. My name is Anna Warwick Sears. I'm the executive director of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. And really, I just want to take a few minutes to say thank you to everybody. Thank you especially, though, to the teams. These issues that have been brought forward to this final competition are so important to the people of the Okanagan. We've had really 
devastating flooding in the last few years. It continues on even this week, another summer of high water. We have consistent chronic problems with the stormwater runoff, which affects our drinking water supply. This is common not just to the people in the Okanagan, but to people all over British Columbia and really throughout Canada. And we also are very, very concerned about the need to keep invasive zebra and quagga mussels away from our lakes and everything that we hold dear with fresh water in British Columbia. So I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of everyone in the Okanagan, thank you for taking on the aqua hacking challenge. Thank you for doing what you're doing. It's wonderful to see this approach where we're blending this ingenuity with these social problems and, and really putting a good energy in minds to address it. So thank you very much and best wishes for all of you as you go forward. Thank you, Anna. I would also like to now welcome the Chief Executive Officer of Aquaform, the organization that's behind aqua hacking across Canada to provide some opening comments. Please welcome Desiree McGraw. Thank you, Aidan and Anna. And greetings from Lac Caribou in the regions north of Montreal, where Aquaforum is headquartered. And welcome to all of you joining us online today. I'm thrilled that you could be with us for this very first BC Aqua Hacking Challenge final. And it is a particular pleasure for me to be kicking this off today because I have been living in beautiful British Columbia for the last few years until recently when I returned to my native Quebec, in part to take up the role as the new CEO of Aquaforum. And so this is my very first aqua hacking challenge, final, and I'm very excited. As you may know, aqua hacking is the flagship of Aquaforum, which was founded in 2015 by the de Gaspé Bolbien family. Indeed, Nanbe, Madame Nanbe de Gaspé Bolbien, and Monsieur Philippe de Gaspé Bolbien asked their children as future philanthropists. They wanted them to help find the philanthropic voice and ask them, what is the cause of greatest concern to you and your generation? The answer was water. It's hard to think of a more inspired choice given the myriad problems facing um, Canada and the world when it comes to water, including fresh water. And of course, Canada being surrounded by three of the world's oceans, uh, comprised of comprising 20% of the world's fresh water and 7% of the world's renewable fresh water, Canada is de facto a water nation. And I believe that we have the opportunity to lead the world in devising and implementing innovative solutions to water problems that are pervasive and persistent, or what are called wicked water problems. And yet all too often, we as Canadians can be complacent and we take for granted the water within our borders. Because we have the ability to respond, I believe that we have the responsibility to make water clean, safe, sustainable, and accessible to all Canadians, both now and in the future. And if we do not act decisively, the lack of access to water, safe drinking water in Indigenous communities, the contamination of water sources in municipalities across Canada and the impact of climate change on water security will irrevocably compromise the triple bottom line of human health, environmental sustainability and economic viability. And if we needed a reminder, COVID reminds us that water and fresh water in particular is at the very core of the health of Canadians, the health of our communities, and the health of our economy. So now here we are, five years later after Aquaforum was founded, here we are at the BC Aqua Hacking Challenge final. The BC Challenge was our very first on the west coast of Canada, and it was the first of three regions alongside Lake Winnipeg and the Atlantic provinces, the first of three challenges that were launched in fall of 2019. And this was made possible by our wonderful partnership with the Okanagan Basin Water Board. And we wanna thank Anna Warwick-Sears from whom you've already heard and her 
her partners, her colleagues, James Litley and Carolina Restrepo, for your wonderful partnership and indeed friendship uh, that has developed over these last few months. I also want to acknowledge uh, our regional partners and funders, the Real Estate Foundation of Canada, Tech Resources, TELUS Canada, and nationally, Ovivo, Lavery, MyTax, and IBM. And of course, the Gaspé Bobier Foundation and the RBC Foundation through its Tech for Nature initiative. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you for your support. I also want to acknowledge my own very talented team at Aquaforum, in particular, Carrie Ann Arup, Melissa Dick, and especially Anne Pascal Richardson. Without your time and your talent and your tireless work, none of this would have been possible. Thank you. I want to recognize our five outstanding judges, each of whom is a leader in their respective field. Meryl Ann Parr, Mike Gerbis, Paulo Callahan, and Nisan Sasran, one of our own alum, I want to thank each of you sincerely for, for your contribution, and I salute you. Five judges, five water issues, and five finalist teams. And so now I conclude with a few remarks for you, our wonderful finalist teams. What you have accomplished in these last few months throughout this process is nothing short of extraordinary. We are thrilled to welcome each of you in Aqua Hacking Startup Alumni Community, which is growing across Canada with each challenge. You are exactly what we believe in. You are the reason that we created this initiative. Bright young people putting your time and your talent and your wonderful brains that are hardwired for innovation into the development of an innovative solutions to wicked water problems. And we believe that Aquaforum through the Aqua Hacking Talent is a catalytic element that will propel your entrepreneurial journey to deploy your impact in the water sector and beyond. We are excited about your future and we're excited about the future of Aquaforum. We are already looking ahead to 2021 and 2022 when we will be once again across Canada with several Aqua Hacking challenges. And of course, the success of our programming and all of this begins with a strong local partnership. So here is a shout out to all of the water leaders across the country who want to leverage the vehicle of a tech challenge, the Aqua Hacking Challenge. If you want to work, engage, and empower a new generation of leaders of talent to the cause of fresh water, give us a shout. Thank you very much. And back to you, Aiden. Thank you, Desiree. Aqua Hacking would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. We would like to recognize both the financial contributions of our sponsors, as well as the non-financial support they have provided throughout the last year of preparing and running the British Columbia Challenge. To better understand why they support Aqua Hacking in British Columbia, I would like to welcome the Director of Grants and Special Projects from the Real Estate Foundation in British Columbia to say a few words. Please welcome Leanne Sexman. Thank you so much, Aiden. It's great to be here today at the finals. I'm joining you from the West Coast on the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish Nation. My name is Leanne Sexsmith and I'm the Director of Grants and Special Projects with the Real Estate Foundation of BC. And in the last five years, we have been able to fund over $4 million in freshwater initiatives that strengthen BC communities and protect our shared lands and waters. As a grant funder, we look for projects that dig deep, connect thinkers and doers, and lead to positive change. Aqua Hacking embraces every approach we think of as a strategic funder. We need real examples and tangible actions that support social, environmental, and economic change. Freshwater health is critically important in BC, and I'd like to thank and congratulate the organizers and the finalists who in just eight months have generated solutions to some of our most pressing water issues and to the other teams whose ideas and proposals will no doubt also continue to inspire and generate solutions. We are very proud to help bring this unique, creative and scalable approach to British Columbia. On behalf of our governors and staff team, I would like to thank everyone here today for contributing and making this happen. 
I can't wait to see the results, uh, not only from today, but in the ongoing efforts and passionate contributions of the teams, peers, and leaders inspired through the Aqua Hacking program. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Leanne, and thank you to the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia. As part of the Aqua Hacking Challenge, the five finalist teams travel to the host region to learn about local water issues, learn from Indigenous knowledge keepers, and to build team skills. This year, due to the COVID, COVID epidemic, this expedition was conducted virtually for the first time. We hope you will enjoy the short video chronicling this experience. Hello everyone. My name is Jay and I am from Team Atlantis. So my name is Megan. I am from Waterlution. Yeah, my name is Oliver. Uh, I'm from Team uh, Ozero. My name is Gavin. I'm from Team Elite. My name is Lucien and I'm from TDS Team with Loop. Okay guys, uh, Carolina. Uh, I'm from Team OBWB. Snowboarding. Wakeboarding. Scuba diving. Sailing. Like watch a nice sunset over a body of water. I think my favorite way to interact with water is the uh, Fish. I like to swim, I love shower, and uh, also kayaking. I just love to grab like a bottle, a large bottle of water and just soak it all up. So that's my favorite way to interact with water. <laughs> we want to welcome you to the Okanagan. This photo can summarize a good part of what you can enjoy here. Amazing views, lakes, beautiful mountains, local agriculture, wine production, and much more. So for our experience, we're going to start in on Okanagan Lake. So Okanagan Lake is a very beautiful place. It's windsurfing and wakeboarding are incredibly popular. And so we'll start our adventure there, get some airtime on our wakeboards. We decided to go uh, sightseeing at the Okanagan Valley to um, uh, look at the beautiful cherry uh, blossom. We all know that the Okan Okanagan Valley is the second largest producer of wine. So obviously we need to put in wine in that meal. Kelowna grows a lot of apples here. So, and we, bake a pie, an apple pie, and that, uh, that would conclude our perfect uh, dining experience in the Okanagan. Finally, we are going to dive right into the World Cafe. The call to be part of something like this, be part of Aqua Hacking, and to be a mentor always brings really exceptional resource guests and leaders because to have that um, desire to support others usually comes with a really amazing leader. Ivan said something that was really profound. I wrote it down as a direct quote. So he said, the public wants to be the protagonist of change, not just the subject of change. With the last group, we had a gentleman that was involved in flood uh, risk mitigation and we recognize that whatever we're trying to do to actually treat stormwater also has to be integrated with flood management so i'm thankful that the organizers here put the different groups in connection like this For our topic wasn't directly relevant to their project but you can see them thinking and hearing the discussions of people coming with different backgrounds and different ideas makes you think about your own topic in a slightly different way and from a different perspective how do we make more self-sufficiency happen how do we get increased funding for long-term projects how do we build a long-term vision so welcome everybody to day two of the expedition. Getting to the finals, you all have amazing skills. The five pillars of what we're gonna be looking at over the weekend is leadership, communication, collaboration, teamwork, and empathy. We are in a competition that uh, the concept of the expedition within the Aqua Hacking Challenge is really to make some connections 
great connection. We are going to dive right into an icebreaker now. It might be pushing you out of your comfort zone. I need some volunteers, one from each team. <laughs> I'm going to start my timer. Go. This is a critical piece of entertainment hardware. This is a, a pig, a golden pig. Oh my goodness, pineapple, the best fruit, tropical. Please just tell us a little bit about what you drew and what it means to you guys. What you first present is a circle of people holding hands and working together. Japanese honeybees managed to deal with these killa hornets by working together. Together they can handle the snow load, dead load. So we're kind of like putting the pieces of the puzzle together. More importantly, I like to try getting to the pizza. I think this form of gathering and training and education and innovation, I think is part of our future. Well, I wanted to say like a big shout out to everyone from Waterlution and Aqua Hacking. I think you did a really great job with um, this virtual retreat. I know it must have been really difficult, but I think that the use of the breakout rooms was really great. I may have gotten more out of this than I would have, even if it were originally uh, in person. Honestly, the workshops, uh, the skill buildings on about um, empathy were really eye opening for me. It really taught me a lot, and I was kind of really surprised by that. And I thank you a lot for that. My whole perspective towards water has, has really changed and I think uh, I, I needed that like to, to look at water as such, such something more spiritual, more sacred. Building this ecosystem around those water issues is very impressive and I'd like to continue in contributing in this kind of event. Thank you. Our water issue leader. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, while the teams weren't able to get out on the water this year, the Okanagan Basin Water Board and Aqua Hacking team putting on the challenge did a great job replicating the experience as well as possible to better help participants intimately understand their relationship with water as well as connect with the water basin to better understand the issues it is facing. Now, to better understand why they got involved with Aqua Hacking across Canada, I will invite two representatives of our national sponsors and supporters to say a few words. The first one would like to speak on behalf of the Royal Bank of Canada Foundation. She is the branch manager on campus at the University of British Columbia Okanagan and the Okanagan College at Royal Bank of Canada. Please welcome Lauren Andrews. Thank you so much for the introduction, Aiden. At RBC, we recognize that the effects of climate change connect us all, that our shared future faces great challenges from food security to air quality, from energy needs to access to clean water. There has never been a greater need for extraordinary solutions. There has never been more opportunity for leadership, collaboration, ingenuity, and vision. That's why RBC is committed to supporting new ideas, technologies, and partnerships to help shape our shared future. We demonstrate this commitment by supporting game-changing initiatives like aqua hacking through RBC Tech for Nature. RBC Tech for Nature is RBC Foundation's multi-year commitment to protecting and preserving the world's greatest wealth, our natural ecosystem. Through RBC Tech for Nature, we're working with the charitable sector to leverage technology to build solutions to presenting challenges like climate change. RBC is so proud to have supported aqua hacking since 2017 to achieve the Pan-Canadian program that meets the needs of the water sector and supports leading entrepreneurs who are solving some of the critical freshwater challenges that we face today. Congratulations to the five finalist teams and on behalf of RBC, we look forward to watching the immense impact that you're going to have on the environmental and business sectors moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you to the RBC Foundation and its Tech for Nature initiative for your ongoing generosity to aqua hacking challenges across Canada. Our new national partner this year, MyTax, is making it possible for teams to enhance their prize winnings from the aqua hacking challenge and providing direct links to business incubators across Canada. We're very excited to welcome MyTax as an official partner, and I would like to welcome the Vice President of Strategic Markets to say a few words. Please welcome Duncan Phillips. Thank you, Aidan, and hello from Noch Walachrum, or as you know it, Bowen Island, part of the traditional and unceded territory of the Squamish peoples. My name is Duncan Phillips, and I am Vice President Strategic Markets at MyTax, 
a national not-for-profit organization that has designed and delivered research and training programs in Canada for over 20 years. We build partnerships that support industrial and social innovation in Canada. And those of you who heard my remarks at the semi-finals will remember that I said that MITAX would have funded over 10,000 national and international research internships by the end of our fiscal year, which at that time was just six days away. We are now in our new year, and this year our target is 15,000 internships. So we will be depending on the aqua-hacking aqua teams for a large number of those. MITAX is thrilled to be part of this innovative challenge, and today is filled with excitement, apprehension, and expectation for us as well as for you. Over the past two weeks, the Lake Winnipeg and Atlantic Regional Challenges held their semi-finals, and I was honored to be one of the judges on the Atlantic Challenge. But today, BC is back in the spotlight, leading the country, as we here on the West Best Coast always expect to do. These five exceptional teams will show us just what they're capable of. Now, let me get out of your way so the fun can begin. I'm looking forward to seeing, seeing how far you have all come since March and to watching how, for, how far you will go from here. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. And thank you to MyTax for your partnership. Now, I would like to officially open the British Columbia 2020 Aqua Hacking Challenge final. We're going to see the final pitches from the teams in a few short minutes. But first, you might be wondering, what is aqua hacking exactly? Well, as you probably already know, the first aqua hacking challenge took place in 2015, and it was established to harness the tech talent of innovative young Canadians to help solve some of our country's most critical water issues. In collaboration with leaders from the water sector, academia, tech, and business, the eighth month aqua hacking challenge program is a catalyst for entrepreneurial solutions and a launch pad for youth-led water tech startups. Since 2015, 17 startups and social enterprises have been established with 30 jobs created in the water sector. Issues tackled ranged all the way from microplastics to invasive species, sewage overflow, blue-green algae, road salt, and many more. This year, we are proud to be delivering the program from coast to coast across Canada in three different regions and the British Columbia Aqua Hacking Challenge is the first among them. Over the last months, 195 young Canadian innovators have applied their passion, skills, and creativity to solve some of British Columbia's most pressing water issues. Mentored and coached by water, tech, engineering, business, and legal experts, only 21 of them remain. Their teams have been selected as finalists last spring and they are now about to pitch their solution and business case to win the challenge. It's been a long journey for them, but actually it's only the beginning. Now, let me introduce the five judges who have accepted to evaluate them and identify the winner. First is Meryl Ann Fair, Commissioner of the International Joint Commission. We also have Mike Gerbis, Chief Executive Officer of the Delphi Group, Globe Series. Nesan Saran, co-founder and CEO of Can Forecast and winner of the 2016 Aqua Hacking Challenge. Ragwa Gopal, president and CEO of Innovate BC. And lastly, Paul O'Callaghan, founder and CEO of Blue Tech Research and director of Brave Blue World. A small reminder of the rules, each team has exactly seven minutes to present its solution and judges will then have a 10 minute period in which they can ask questions of the team. Just so you know, the order of the presentation was random, randomly selected via a draw. And the beauty of today's final is that each team, no matter what their final ranking is, will win a prize. So let's see what's up for grabs. First prize is $20,000 in seed funding. Second place prize is $15,000 in seed funding. Third place prize is $10,000 in seed funding. And fourth and fifth place prizes are $2,500 in seed funding. Before we begin, it is worth noting that each team is eligible to double their prize amount due to MyTax providing a matching fund. Thank you, MyTax. And now I would like to welcome and introduce one of the driving forces behind Aqua Hacking, Nan B. de Gaspi Bobian. She is the co-chair of Aqua Hacking's founding organization and major national sponsor, 
to the Gaspi Bobia Foundation, and I can't say enough good things about her. Welcome, Nande. Thank you, Aiden. Isn't this great to be able to be introduced by your grandson? First, I would like to share with all of you the many gifts that our family has received by becoming involved in water. Number one, it has brought three generations working together to solve the issue or help solve the issue of water. Secondly, it has helped us to envision aqua hacking, which after all is a very novel way of bringing together young techies to find solutions to water. And third, you know, bringing aqua hacking across Canada has really helped us in our family develop our vision, our dream, for ensuring that all Canadians become aware of the great water heritage of our country and that they will join us in protecting this great heritage. But you know, none of this would be possible without awesome community partners. And we are very lucky to have indeed uh, in the BC region, a great partner in the Okanagan Water Basin. I really think that with their team, their partners and their sponsors, they have made a great difference. I'd like to just call attention to two particular groups, RBC and the Real Estate Foundation, who have been extra special in helping out this region. I also want to thank all of you for joining with us, for taking a risk and realizing that together we can and do make a difference. And finally, to each, to each of the wonderful entrepreneurial young people, innovators across our country, I send my blessings. Thank you for all the hard work that you have been doing to find solutions to our water issues. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, puis je retourne à mon petit-fils, Eda. Thank you to Nanbe and the De Gaspé Vaubien Foundation. Aqua Hacking would not be here today without you. You may not know, but once teams compete in the Aqua Hacking Challenge, they become a part of our alumni community, remaining networked with other Aqua Hackers and are able to reach out and help each other. Let's hear from one of the past aqua hacking teams, Clean Nature, who won second place prize last year in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Basin Aqua Hacking Challenge. Please welcome Claudie Hatier, Anne Carabin, and Patricia Gomez. Hola, bonjour, hello everyone. This is Patricia, Claudie, and Anne from Clean Nature. Today we want to share with you our aqua hacking experience, what we have been doing since we won the second place at the 2019 Aqua Hacking Final. We also want to share with you our plans for the coming years as we are still working to tackle the environmental road salt issue. We met during our master and PhD degrees at the university and as we were concerned by the road salt impacts on aquatic ecosystems, we decided to enter into Aqua Hacking Challenge to think beyond existing technologies and to develop and focus in creating a realistic cutting edge technology to help winter stakeholders to optimize current de-icing practices. Uh, it worth saying that the idea behind clean nature, the name of clean nature, comes from salt, the salt molecule itself, and ACL. Indeed, clean nature developed GIA a smart decision-making tool based on artificial intelligence that uses real-time meteorological and road conditions to accurately predict salt doses to be applied on our roads. GIA is designed to be a user-friendly tool developed as a web-based application to better support work of winter stakeholders. Hi everyone, salut tout le monde. Um, so, aqua hacking was a really great experience for us uh, as we were able to develop and concretize our ideas through this challenge. Uh, we were also thrilled to be part of uh, this 
uh, great competition as we received an amazing support from uh, AH mentors and still we have a great support by uh, Aqua Hacking ever since thanks to Anne Pascal and Melissa. Thanks also to uh, the Aqua Hacking Challenge. Uh, we had few interviews um, in different uh, newspapers and radios such as uh, Radio Canada, CBC, Le Soleil, um, Agence Science Price, and so on. Um, a lot of things uh, moved forward for King Nature since the Aqua Hacking Challenge. First, um, we officially incorporated and created our startup. Uh, then we participated to another challenge uh, by the WWF Canada and we were one of the four award recipients for the Water Tech Challenge uh, 2019. Uh, and as part of this challenge, we received uh, another important funding and uh, we are now part of a six-month accelerator program. Hi everyone. So we're currently collaborating with another, another DIC company to improve our tool gear. We are thrilled by this collaboration since it will help us to improve our tool, uh, but also its application on the field for next winter. Clean Nature is also super excited to be part of the ESRI Startup Program established by ESRI, the pioneers company that has developed the world widely used GIS mapping software object. So, many things have moved forward since the October final, and we will continue to work hard to, to be part of the Canadian startup, helping to reduce wood salt and to protect our ecosystems. For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and also contact us via email to info.cleannature at gmail.com. So, stay tuned for the Generation Water Tech pitch in September in Toronto. We also want to encourage the 2020 finalists and congratulate them for making it to the final. Congratulations. Stay focused and keep on keep on working hard. As a final word, we want to thank again Hakwa Hacking as well as the Gaspi Bubia Foundation for their support. Thank you again. Good luck to the finalists. Thank you, Claudie, Anne, and Patricia. Now we will watch the five finalist teams pitches to the judges. During this time, we would like you, our national audience, to join us in the awarding of a special prize by public vote. In order to do this, join us on www.sli.do slide.do and enter the code AQUAHACKING2020. Note, AQUAHACKING is in all caps. The team who receives the most votes from the public will receive an additional prize of $1,000. Ready? There are five teams, five future startups made up of 21 team members coming from across the country. We are really proud to welcome them and discover how far they've gone since the semifinal. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Saul, and I'm the CEO of Gravity Assisted Particle Separation Systems. My partners are Rudy Kumar, Will White Robinson, Jaden Wong, and Graham Kumagai. The five of us are all first year engineering students at UBC Okanagan, and it was there at the school and through our studies that we all met each other. Now that we're all living and studying in Kelowna, which is a community with such strong connections to the lakes and rivers that surround it, it's really opened our eyes and made us realize how important water is to us and our community, and it's inspired us to protect it. And so in terms of the company itself, that all began in our sustainable engineering design course we were given the opportunity to create a project that just so happened to align with the BC aqua hacking water issues. And we quickly became very interested in protecting Okanagan's aquatic system from stormwater contaminants, and we were really determined to find a solution. So we worked very hard all semester, we, we made some great progress, but as the course came to an end, we just felt that our job was not done yet. And we really wanted to create a marketable, implementable design that could truly improve the quality of water entering the Okanagan Lakes. And that is what led us to pursue the BC Aqua Hacking Challenge. And so, in terms of the name of our product, that is GAPS, Gravity Assisted Particle Separation Systems. And we chose that because we are aspiring engineers and we're very attracted to the technical functionality of our design. And because it 
achieves its purpose of contaminant separation with no moving parts, just gravity. That's how we came up with our name. Now looking forward and at the future of our business, we really just want to continue to grow and continue to do research to come up with the best solution possible. And this competition has given us an incredible opportunity to do that. And that's why we've given it all we've got to get the best possible result. My name is Jacob, and my teammates and I have formed Gravity Assisted Particle Separation Systems. We're a group of first year engineers that have created a team driven to protect our water. I want you to take a look at this image. This is Kelowna, a beautiful city, no doubt. And the water is a huge contribution to that. But for those of you who live here, or are at least familiar with the Okanagan lifestyle, you know that it is more than just about beauty. The water supports life, it drives our economy, and it ultimately brings people together. But this reality is slipping away. With increasing infrastructure, more and more contaminated stormwater runoff is making its way into our sacred lakes. If we don't intervene now, our lakes could be forever changed for the worse. I'd like to hand it over to Rudy to further explain. So how did we get here? Naturally, stormwater from rainfall should soak into the ground where it joins aquifers. However, due to urbanization, the landscape of our cities has changed, and the introduction of impervious surfaces like concrete and asphalt have made it so that stormwater now flows through our streets where it collects contaminants before entering catchment basins and ultimately converging to central water bodies such as the Okanagan Lake in Kelowna, BC. Now, hydrocarbons are a pretty obvious contaminant. However, sediment is often overlooked. Sediment is problematic for two main reasons. Firstly, sediment increases the cloudiness or turbidity of the water. This is bad for photosynthetic species, which depend on sunlight to produce food and thereby any other species which depend on them. Secondly, sediment acts as a transporter for other contaminants such as biochemicals and heavy metals that have a tendency to bind onto them. Moreover, the lack of data regarding stormwater contamination makes informed decision making currently impossible. If we continue to let this problem run without intervention, we will see declining appeal of our beautiful BC water bodies, increased human contact with contaminants in recreational lakes, and degrading aquatic ecosystems. Ultimately, taxpayer funding will be required for cleanup efforts. We present to you our solution, GAPS, a simple product that slides seamlessly into existing catchment basins. GAPS performs three main functions. Firstly, it directly removes hydrocarbons from stormwater. Secondly, it directly removes sediment from stormwater and thereby is able to remove any sediment mobilized contaminants. Thirdly, it records real-time data regarding turbidity and water flow rate through built-in sensors. Now we'd like to show you a demonstration. On the right-hand side, you can see the control. This is our current infrastructure without gaps installed. On the left-hand side, you have a version with gaps installed. We poured the same high turbidity water through both cases. And let's take a look at the results. This is the water that flowed out of our control without gaps installed. And this is the water that flowed with gaps installed. A remarkable difference indeed. As social entrepreneurs, we strive to do the best for our society. And through gaps, we'll be able to deliver 50 to 80% cleaner water into our central water bodies. We'll be able to remove the contaminants as early as possible in the cycle. Because sediment transports other contaminants, removing sediment as early as possible has a compound effect. GAPS is affordable, which means it's accessible for all municipalities, not just the big ones. Therefore, we'll be able to maintain our pristine water bodies province-wide that drive our tourism-driven economy. The data we collect through GAPS will lead to new stormwater management insights, and it will support critical environmental research. Our solution is unique. Firstly, it's simple. There's no moving parts, very easy installation, and most importantly, it can be retrofitted into existing city infrastructure. GAPS is affordable at only 10% the cost of our competitors, while still being effective as it removes 80% of sediment and up to 90% of hydrocarbons. We have synced the GAPS maintenance cycle with the existing maintenance cycle for catchment basins, which brings the marginal cost for maintenance down to only $5 per unit. GAPS is scalable. It requires no infrastructure modification and can be deployed flexibly. You don't need to put one in every drain, just the high volume ones. GAPS is also data driven and it's able to produce valuable real time data sets where in a market there is none currently. I'd like to hand it over to Cole now. In 2013, Kelowna's annual budget for stormwater management was $85 million. In 2020, BC's budget for environmental protection was a quarter of a billion dollars. Our solution is a one time investment at a fraction of this annual budget. Our business model revolves around two main pillars, the first of which being direct sales. 
Initially, this will be towards private clients, such as golf courses and resorts, looking to maintain their pristine water bodies. We will move into municipalities eventually. The second pillar is data packages. These are subscription-based and will be sold annually. The data packages will go towards research groups, environmentalist groups, and government agencies, those who currently lack access to this vital data. Our competition consists of hydrodynamic separators, porous pavement, and storm drain filters. Hydrodynamic separators, such as the storm separator shown on the right here, are expensive and extremely disruptive to install. Porous pavement also requires a modification of existing infrastructure making it infeasible to implement in a, in a city system. Storm drain filters have a tendency to overflow and have a limited capacity. Our solution does not have a limiting capacity and does not require the modification of existing infrastructure. We have validated our eco-friendliness through life cycle analysis. We have also completed prototyping and SOLIDWORKS modeling to ensure the optimization of our design. In the near future, we will simultaneously conduct laboratory testing and build our software infrastructure after which we will pilot a 25-unit network, hopefully in Kelowna. In January of 2021, we will enter negotiations for selected municipalities. In the first year, our attention will be focused towards product development. This means we will continue to prototype and build our software web application. In year two, we will move into private sales. We will begin manufacturing as we secure smaller clients. We will also begin negotiation with municipalities during this period. In year three, when we have two private and two medium-sized clients, we will have a final optimized product. The medium-sized clients will consist of small municipalities such as Vernon or Lake Country, and we will use economies of scale to bring down our manufacturing costs. I'd like to now hand it over to Jacob to talk about our team. So here we have our dream team. On the left, you can see is our current team. And on the right, we we're showing that we, in the future, decided to implement a board of advisors. This board would include experts in various fields that would help us maximize our impact. Thank you very much for your attention. And now we'd now like to open this time up to any questions. Um, I'll, I'll jump in to begin with, if you like. So the, um, the business case and the benefits are, are quite clear, well set out. I think just in terms of the functionality of the unit and how it works, it would be great to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I can speak to this topic for you. So we really address two types of contaminants principally. One is hydrocarbons. And what happens is, is our system consists of a hollow column, which allows water to flow through it, but water is maintained at a certain level. And we have hydrocarbon absorbent pads, which are placed at the water line. And through density, hydrocarbons rise to the top, which allow them to be absorbed without restricting any flow of water. Secondly, we promote sedimentation of any contaminants within the water by altering the fluid flow through the system. In that way, we don't actually present a membrane that filters out certain things, which would be constrictive of water flow. Instead, we just change the way in which it flows by slowing it down in such a way that it promotes sedimentation, which gets rid of the sediments before the water has an opportunity to rise back up and exit through the effluent pipe. What's the uh, cost of uh, the unit itself? So would, would, would the capital cost be a hindrance in uh, uh, municipalities adopting this? Well, um, each unit itself costs around $200 to manufacture. That includes the sensors and the transportation labor costs, manufacturing everything. Um, so when we're looking at different municipalities, when we're looking at Kelowna, for example, they have around 9,000 storm drains. We estimate there to be about 2,000 of these drains in downtown Kelowna in the most affected area. Now, if we then implement these uh, products into the most strategic of these drains, say 1,000, we'd look at a total implementation cost of around $200,000 for all of them. And you mentioned you have a prototype already. So uh, how mm -hmm. close are you to uh, having a product that would be commercially viable and available? So in terms of our in terms of our market readiness, we really want to dedicate the first year, uh, the better part of the first year, towards um, research and development. Just while we optimize our uh, our product, you know, all the work that we've been able to do has been under the the constraint of being at home and being the best that we can there. But we are developing contacts at the University of British Columbia in Okanagan to get laboratory testing, and there we want to basically create a control sample and we want to do proper scientific testing to generate statistical significance and optimize our product in laboratory. And then as our timeline suggests, in about, uh, in about October, we wanna go ahead and move towards field testing with a 25 unit pilot in Kelowna. Dependent on the, on the success of that pilot, we could be market ready much sooner um, and we can go to market earlier. 
However, one thing that I think is to be said is that uh, municipal municipal clients are great because they have so many catchment basins in need of our product. However, with municipal clients, you suffer from a long sales cycle. Um, that's why you see a larger of our, more of our profits kicking in in year three, even though we would begin market readiness at the beginning of year two. It just happens that the market, uh, the sales cycle is so long that we wouldn't see any money later on. But that's why we have the private clients that we will pitch to and we will sell to in year two to give us cash flow to sustain operations until that profitability has time to prevail. Hi, everyone. My name is Benjamin, and I'm going to help you learn a little bit more about O0. O0 was started about a year ago by a group of mechanical engineering students from the University of Sherbrooke in Quebec. During the last year of our bachelor's degree, we need to do a project referred to as the major design project. Since we wanted to have a positive impact on society, we decided to tackle the ever-growing problem of aquatic invasive species. Along the way, we realized that, it, that we wanted to make much more than a year-long project. We wanted to make a company out of it. Ozero comes from the English translation of the word lake in Russian. We thought it sounded really good, and it was also a great nod to the purpose of our project since it included the word water and zero, which reminded us of a body of water with zero aquatic invasive species. When a staff member of the university heard about our project, he, he suggested to us to participate in the aquaking challenge. According to him, we were the perfect fit for the invasive mussels challenge. When we looked more deeply into it, we realized that it would be a very good opportunity for us to participate in an English competition outside of Quebec. Plus, it also helped us reach the whole new market of the west of Canada. Water is important for everyone. It is Earth's most precious resource and we must preserve it. Barely nothing can grow or survive without it, so we understand how precious it is. Um, we come we, we all grew near a major body of water in the Ozero team, the St. Lawrence River. So we also understand the importance water plays in people's lives. Our long-term goal is to be implemented in as much municipalities as possible in order to save as many lakes as possible. That's why we're doing sensitization with everyone we can and we're talking to as much municipalities as we can. Thank you very much. So this is the impact zebra and quagga mussels have on industrial pipes, on boats, on shores, and even on other aquatic species. As you can see, they latch onto pretty much everything that is available. But how can a lake go from being pristine to being invaded? Invasive mussels are transported from lake to lake via boat. When a boat leaves a contaminated lake and goes into a clean one, it contributes to the propagation of the exotic species. Nine times out of 10, this is how zebra and quagga mussels are introduced into a lake. The spreading of invasive mussels is going from east to west, rapidly reaching BC. The impact on the Okanagan Basin would be massive. The invasion of zebra mussels would cost annually $42 million to its surrounding municipalities through infrastructure costs, fishing, and tourism loss. To avoid these costs and to prevent mussels invasion, the municipalities currently have one solution. It is to install a boat washing station, which decontaminates the hull and trailer before launching. But the implementation creates new pains, such as the research and the assembly of numerous parts. Even after that, a boat that enters the Okanagan Basin would only be half washed. That's because an important part of the boat is not decontaminated, ballasts. Ballasts are cavities in a boat that are filled with the lake's water to create bigger waves when practicing nautical sports. We know for a fact that 50% of the propagation of exotic species is caused by those cavities. A contaminated boat can carry as much as 2,000 mussel larvae in its ballasts. Knowing that very few can lead to the invasion of the lake, it is as important to wash the ballast system as the rest of the boat. In brief, the washing methods available right now do not solve the entire problem, and this is where we step in. I'm Olivier Arpin, and here's my colleague Mathieu Stessier. We are O0, and this is how we intend to preserve our Canadian lakes. We have developed a washing station for watercraft, which not only decontaminates the hull and the trailer, but also the ballast. To wash the hull, we use the same technology municipalities are used to, which is basically a pressure washer with hot water. Our competitive edge is that we also wash the ballast. To do so, we use active suction cups to fix our system onto the boat and fill the ballast with hot water, just as seen on screen. Using hot water as a decontamination product enables us to kill mussels and other invasive species while still being eco-friendly. Our team has been working full-time on the project since May, and we achieved lots in the past few months. 
managed to raise $60,000 through wage subsidy, competition grants, and sponsorships. This helped us in finalizing the design and the assembly of our MVP, which is the technology to decontaminate the ballast system. We also talked about it with 37 municipalities in Quebec, and most of them are already interested in our product. So we decided to install our system in a trailer to facilitate transportation. Then, this summer, we will travel from municipality to municipality, showcasing our product around Quebec. Working with different early adopters will help us understand their way of working and perfect our product. On top of that, these demonstrations will promote our MVP and sensitize people about the importance of washing ballast. This is the first major step of our go-to-market strategy. The next step will be to offer the complete station to Quebec municipalities. This could represent 800 sales. After being well established in Quebec, we want to address the Canadian market representing 5,000 sales prospects. But most importantly, this represents thousands of opportunities for Ozero to have a positive impact on aquatic ecosystems. Our cost and market analysis are based on several interviews made with potential clients. Units will be sold directly to municipalities for $35,000 and our cost to manufacture is under $20,000. We then offer a 10-year maintenance plan. For our clients, this means effortless, man man effortless management of their washing station. For us, it means a recurring revenue stream that would assure income stability in the future. We also did our cash flow budget for the next three years, and this led to our KPIs. For this summer, we aim to visit at least five municipalities and wash a minimum of 100 boats. One year from now, we want to have made our first two sales with influential municipalities. We also want to have a partnership with the Union of Quebec Municipalities to better showcase our product throughout the province. Then, three years from now, we aim to have made a total of 13 sales in Quebec. Achieving these indicators will ensure the viability of Ozigo throughout time. We will then be able to expand our market to the west of Canada. To get there, we have important next step. Starting next week, we will be at Lac Megan 6 launching ramp, our main partner, and we will be operating our MVP. Then, during July and August, we will offer day-to-day -day ballast washing services all around Quebec. Our presence in the field this summer will deepen our knowledge of future clients and help us make our first sales. We'll also do water analysis on decontaminated ballast to quantify the number of invasive species we counter. This will show municipalities how important it is to wash ballast. In the meantime, we will deposit a provisional patent. This will protect our technology for the next year while giving us enough time to commercialize our product and pursue the full patent. We'll also continue working on our co-founders agreement to be ready for incorporation in early 2021. Later this year, we'll finish the design for the complete washing station. A final prototype will be built and showcased to municipalities. And that's how we would use the Aquahacking prize money. We are a team of senior undergraduates in mechanical engineering. As we are all from the same background, we surrounded ourselves with complementary mentors. We work with Jacques Routier, who helps us build a viable business model, and with Isabelle Arsenault, a biology expert, who helps us optimize our decontamination process. On top of that, the Quebec Ministry of Environment often reviews our product and recently approved it for testing. As a team, we can help municipalities around the Okanagan Basin solve a $42 million problem with a $35,000 solution. And together, we can stop the spread of invasive mussels in our Canadian lakes. Thank you. So you, you say municipalities are your customers. That's the initial customers. And yes. uh, is it one station per lake or one station per municipality? It's one station per municipality. Thank you. And have you uh, engaged a number of municipalities and got feedback from them? Yeah, we, uh, about, of, of the 37 municipalities we talked to, about 25 uh, are really interested to, uh, for us to go uh, at their launching ramp and test our, our, our MVP. So um, yeah, we're, we're uh, about one call away from uh, being at their launching ramp. So yeah, everything's all set. You mentioned that uh, Quebec's Ministry of Environment has validated your product. Uh, can you walk us through the steps you took to make this happen? Yeah, so uh, first we contacted the Quebec Ministry of Environment a while back to uh, talk about our problematic and explain our, pro our project and how we were approaching it. So they got really interested into our project. So we started recently talking to them more and more and more frequently. So about twice a month. 
and uh, because we want to test our product on the on the municipalities this summer, we decided to make it more official and ask them for the approval and to review our product so that they would make sure that municipalities have no problems and no fears and nothing like that. So that's that's how it went. So you got an official so approval I... from the... Yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah. got an official approval for, from the Quebec Ministry of Environment. So walk me through, um, you sell one of these to the municipality and then the municipality's uh, officials, their personnel, use this equipment and do you come back and maintain it sometimes however whatever frequency you do that on um and am i right so far yeah yeah absolutely yeah. okay and then um what happens to the wastewater that your system has used like you've basically sterilized the ballast water what happens to that and is that part of your solution or is that something now the municipality has to deal with if they buy your product yeah um we basically we designed the uh the prototype and the product itself um to be able to uh, um, add some technology to recirculate the water and to reuse the water um to not waste the water first and for energy consumption and uh, but for now it's not uh, fully uh, done yet so um, the municipalities when they have their um, their washing station the ground itself is uh, made for um, uh, to prevent the water from uh, going in the lake so there's a, a safe distance from the lake and the uh, the, the soil is uh, is soaking the the water so there's no possible way to uh, to infest the, the lake but with the solution. I see, okay. I really like uh, the solution. I think there's definitely a need. The only thing I'm having a little difficulty trying to kind of figure out, say, uh, scaling up of your business. What would the business look like, uh, say, 10 years from now? How, I guess, in simple forms, how big is the market? Like, can this be a, a $10 million business or is it a, a million dollar business? We, as, as we mentioned, uh, there's about uh, 5,000 sales, uh, like opportunities in, uh, in Canada. But um, yeah, for, for the, the business to grow and grow more, um, the, the south of uh, the USA is really interesting because they uh, have these boats going from lake to lake all year round. So, uh, so when the Canadian market will be saturated, let's say, we could go to, um, to USA and we evaluated that the market itself for the only the north of USA and Canada uh, is about a $1 billion market. We've just to complete on that. We've we're also currently looking into a different solution to diversify our, uh, our proposition value. So we found uh, some opportunities to sell information about the zebra mussels we collect and uh, water analysis we do to the Quebec Ministry of Environment, who's ready to pay for it. So it's like a contract service, they call it in French. So we were ready to engage into that this summer also to uh, add more money into the income of Zero, but due to COVID was delayed. So it will probably go back to it uh, next summer. So it's mm -hmm. an additional income that the company will make. Hi everyone, we are Team Elise. I'm Kivan from Kelowna. I'm Harvey from Kelowna. I'm Gavin from Kelowna. And I'm Almond and I reside in the Lower Greenland. We are the graduates of civil engineering technology from Okinawa College and currently studying for a degree at UBCO. We always had the passion to think outside of the box and we wanted to change the world around us. So when Aqua High provided the opportunity for us to think critically about the contamination of stormwater, we said, why not? Let's take the challenge. So you might think, is water important for everyone? It is. Water is important for every individual on this planet, but it's not appreciated by everyone. So through our innovative technology and our education for our community, we're going to bring that appreciation to everyone. And you might think, okay, where did the name come from? Elite. The name actually comes from barbecues that we had at Harvey. It comes from the brand of this barbecue, which reminds us of good time, delicious time, and the name is prestigious. So we say, you know what, let's go for it. Let's choose the name. And our long-term vision for, for 
our team is to really expand our brand, which is A to Z filter. And in order to do that, which results in improved water quality of our stormwater that which leads into our lakes, streams, and everything. So imagine through our technology and our innovative ideas, we are converting this to this. Can't wait to see you guys. Hi everyone. Let me welcome you on behalf of my team and A to Z filter to our virtual pitch from Okanagan area. Hopefully one day I see you guys face to face and have more conversation with you guys. Basically, in, um, I want to introduce you my lovely team and passionate individual to you guys. We have Harvier, we have Gavin, we have Ahmed and myself, Kevan. We are graduates of civil engineering technology from Okanagan College and currently pursuing our degree at UBCO and civil engineering as well. Well, in January 2020, Aquahack introduced us to the challenge and we started to do some investigation. We found out that a lot of hydrocarbons and oils from vehicles are leaking and finding their way to a catch basin and our stormwater and ending up in our lakes and streams. So we started to do a little bit of research. Unfortunately, there was no filtration at the stormwater outlets or there's no treatment involved there. You know, having um, pollutants and hydrocarbons in water, it's not only Okanagan area's issue, it's actually like a worldwide issue. And thanks to the problems that we faced during the COVID-19, we realized that actually a lot of things that we have, we shouldn't take it for advantage and food safety and security is one of the things we should be careful about it. Um, as a matter of fact, Interior Health released a report recently that if the proper measure are not taken right now to basically preserving our water sources right now. In the future, it's going to cost us more to upgrade our systems in order to make it potable. So as a matter of fact, Vernon would cost, which is the north of Okanagan Lake, would, would cost almost $400 million to have that system upgraded. And you might ask, okay, like, like tourism, and you know, it's one of the attraction points of Okanagan, they're not really involved directly. Well, out of the $1.25 billion of GDP of that generated from Okanagan area, $620 million of it is from tourism. So I don't think the tourists would like to be spending time at dirty beaches or like restaurants uh, or like orchards or the vineyards that are like around the contaminated lake. Yes, there are, there are some solutions out there, some feathers out there, but you know, the cost is very expensive. Average cost $30,000 plus uh, installation. The, the size of enormous, they don't actually like filter out what is it mixed with the water and the maintenance and logistic is is beyond like what you can imagine sometimes you know what we start to do research what is what is actually available for what kind of media is available for for filtration system actually and yes activity carbon graphite they are available but you know there's a there's a carbon footprint involved with them and they're very expensive and believe it or not actually human hair has that Adsorption capacity. So absorption is for sponge. Sponge grabs all the chemical and contaminants and water inside of it. But adsorption, which allows the water to go through, but contaminants will stick to the media. Hair has more adsorption capacity than um, activated carbon. So and NASA actually has done extensive research about it. Has they have tested it for reusability and recycling it, and has been used. For oil spills and after its life cycle is done, it actually could be used for oyster mushroom farm, which is a commodity which we can. And also we have abundant amount of it available. As a matter of fact, in Okanagan, Tommy Guns Barbershop has partnered with us to provide the raw material for us. They have four branches here. There are seminal branches across Canada. And for sanitizer purpose of it, we actually, we just need a UV treatment of it. So based on what media we have available and the design, the design of our kidney inspired by that, we, we, we established our prototype in March 2020. We started we start testing it and we had an objective for it. We wanted to maximize our filtration of hydrocarbons, maximize efficiency, minimize turbidity, and minimize maintenance. We just need gra gravity and it's user friendly. Each one of the cartridges look like this, replaceable like a printer. It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of aesthetic work. We send our tests to Caro Analytical. They're a very accredible lab in Kona. They started testing our water before and after, tributary reduced, hydrocarbons reduced, and we have we have less than a two minute video available. During the question and answer, you can ask for it, we can, we can display it for you guys. And num the, the extensive report is available too. You see here, we have before and after picture. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I told the team, 
I would definitely swim in the water and uh, in the right bucket. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really swim in the left bucket. You know, now we know what we have. So definitely we have to like look at who are our clients. So municipalities, obviously, like they're interested in this product. In, in Okanagan, we have, we have 14 and BC, and then we, we look at in Canada and as it, it, it increases the number uh, as we go to provincial, national, and international. And then we went to, de to developers. Actually, we reached the private sector. We actually have a testimonial of a developer that's interested in our product. So we say, okay, so now we have, let's look at the number of developers we can work with, and we see the number increases as we go into provincial, national, the other area. So based on the needs, we started to design three different products, different sizes for municipal, commercial, and residential. And we, we wanted to make the sizes feasible and our, our pricing competitive. Why? Because we believe we want to change the world. So rather than like really making a lot of profit, we wanted to make it accessible and affordable for everyone. So because in reality, we are a social enterprise too. So based on that, based on these needs, we start to like make a simple financial plan for, for the first fiscal year. And since we're gonna get our own hands dirty, we are, we are civil engineer technologists ourselves, we're gonna do a lot of installation ourselves. So make, generate profit for that. We are, our, our expenses for office and just like Microsoft, Amazon, those big companies that start from the garage, we actually start from the garage too. We, we try to minimize a lot of our costs and increase our production and, and that. So our timeline is very manageable and basic. So basically you see our, our one had a pilot project with the city of Kelowna to generate a lot of data, learnings from us and ourselves starting next year and being at the buildings and many other arenas to market it and distribute it throughout BC in 2020. The last thing I want to say from the bottom of my heart to you guys, and this is the reality of it is, our liability is not even to all ourselves. It is, it is also to the generation to come. And if you don't act quickly, we will face the consequences of our action in short term and long term. So by investing in A to Z filter, which uses a renewable and environmentally friendly filtration media, you are going to be the shareholders of a sustainable and innovative enterprise. So Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to your question. Great presentation. So uh, just the unit itself, I'm just talking the municipal version, not the residential or commercial. Um, what would, does it work with the in existing infrastructure that municipalities have and how easy it is to integrate to that? Yeah, so the way that uh, our system would work is it would be implemented at a retention point. So um, after the development, wherever the, the catchment is, we would actually put it at a retention pond before it actually went into the retention pond. Um, otherwise, uh, the second option was to actually, where it would connect to the city name, we would put our system there. So for a city like Kelowna, it's not the $9,600 spend. What, what would they have to uh, spend to get your solution in that covers the whole city? Okay, so uh, in, in the city of Kelowna basically out of that $9,600, there's a few things we, we have to start collaborating. One thing is that uh, because, because there's no treatment right now involved in any of the storm outlets, we, we need to really get their land space involved because our size, the biggest size that we have for, for municipal is, is our biggest size for municipal size. So the city of Kelowna, we just have to like work for the maintenance of it, which is every, it's every six months or it's annually, depending, depending on the flow rate coming to the, the filtration system. A uh, hi question regarding uh, your partnership with the city of Kelowna is this uh, are you talking with them currently uh, do you have interest and also in the review that you prepared for us uh, you had uh, a letter or I think it was a review from Victor Projects LTD that was interested in your solution um, how, how close is this to an actual pilot so basically, uh, we had a we had a great conversation with with the developer, the city of Kona, as you mentioned. Uh, we went and visited the site. We demonstrated our prototype actually, and it was very interesting that as soon as the idea was pitched and how low maintenance and it doesn't require a lot of logistics such as electricity or anything, immediately we got the we got response and that kind of gave us the indication that we can go on private sector too. So rather than municipality, that private sector was the interest. So. Um, these, these guys were introduced to us by our mentor. So we went to a job site and just had a discussion with them. 
Okay, and regarding the city of Kelowna, is this have you been talking to uh, municipal people over there? Yes, we have. We have. We have started conversation. We were actually going to meet them face to face. Uh, due to the COVID, we, we just like having obstacle with having meeting people face to face because our our prototype is actually a physical entity. And when people actually see it, how it works live, just like the video I mentioned, uh, we should have been like um, presented to you guys, mm -hmm. but like it actually changes a lot of people's perception because our our waste product is is not going to be taking any landfill because a lot of times city of corona talks about the maintenance the landfill and all these things and but actually our prototype as i mentioned this is this is the cartridge for prototype it's something simple that we can handle mm -hmm. all right thanks last question uh on your ninety six hundred dollars uh per unit what's your estimated profit so actually our cost, and you, the reason you are, everyone's shocked about the pricing of it is because we have construction background and we can start manufacturing it ourselves. We are saving a lot of uh, labor costs and, and manufacturing. And we, our cost was multiplied by 60% profit because as we said, we don't want to, we don't want to be greedy. Um, otherwise it would be non-affordable. It was mentioned by one of the judges that a lot of municipalities are broke. They don't have money. To, to invest and we just we just face COVID and that budget is is getting reduced and reduced. Thank you. So um, I'd like to talk to you about your raw materials and yes. how you get that um, because I know if it's as it's similar to kind of the um, collecting organic waste, home recycling, organics, um, home, home compost stuff, and it's a it's really hard to organize those things and to get people to do it. And so, I, and I didn't see a clear sense from your materials what that's going to cost you, and how are you going to actually get all of those raw materials in a consistent way? That's a very good question, actually. Yeah. So we're going to be providing uh, barber shops with a with a recycle bin with our logo on it, and that itself, and and we have we have indicated to them that any any hair bigger than one inch would be would be deposited. We're not going to cause any obstacle in their operation. And it would be collected on a weekly and bi-weekly basis and it would be stored and UV treated before being handled like for for sanitation purposes so we have already uh, started our communication and finding many like we have already right now like other than Tommy Guns, two other barber shops willing to participate and we have the, the testimonies here too to participate in our program so just to follow up on that so you're actually conceiving of creating bins going around to all the hair shops they put it in there, you pick it up once or very, however frequently, and, and your costs, your profit margins currently include all the costs of all that collection? Yes, yes. Because because we, we, they're not charging us for anything for the hair. They were actually so supportive that they were willing to like do it. And each bin that we're designing, it's not going to be a fancy bin. It's actually like just a, just a normal bin that you see in a dollar store with a cap. So you just open and close. We're not, we're not, we're not going to make things complicated for anyone that it would, it would cause an obstacle. Because as soon as things become complicated, a lot of people have hesitation towards participating in this program. Mm -hmm. We are Above Atlantis, and we're a team of four from Vancouver, BC. This team formed one by one, each of us drawn in by the vision to make an impact in BC communities. We have Hanya, our data analyst, Shantanu, our environmental scientist, and Josh, our communication specialist, and myself as a project lead for Above Atlantis. Our team sets out to tackle the challenges around flooding by collecting, cataloging, modeling, and visualizing water flow data to predict the likelihood of flooding. Our name is inspired by what we do. Atlantis was a city of Greek mythology, a society that was well ahead of their time, but sunk to the bottom of the sea. The story of Atlantis reminds us that even the most advanced societies are not impervious to nature and to water. Therefore, we need to understand water to be prepared and to give it room to flow where it needs to flow. We need to go above Atlantis and thus our name. Aqua Hacking has supported and connected us, allowing our solutions to grow past what we could do on our own. We decided to participate in the BC Aqua Hacking Challenge because it's different from many other hackathons. We have been able to go beyond the ideation stage, connecting with the real world issues and learning from experts in the field, as well as building a functional prototype. 
Our long-term vision for our business is to see our work being used by communities throughout BC. We know we have succeeded when communities are empowered to make informed decisions around flooding. With climate change, the frequency and the magnitude of floods are increasing on average. And communities need to know what they can do in the face of these growing challenges. Thank you for tuning in to the BC Aqua Hacking Finals, and we are looking forward to sharing our project, Above Atlantis, with all of you. Hello, everyone. Um, we are Above Atlantis, and our objective is to provide high quality flood information at low cost to communities in BC. Today, 10% of Canada's population lives in high risk flood zones. Of those, only 6% are aware that they live in these risk areas. Financially, flooding can be catastrophic, causing billions of dollars in damage, with these costs growing each year. As we look into the future, flood mitigation will become increasingly important. These climate change scenarios show a future with increasing rainfall intensity, which will lead to stronger and more frequent floods. Currently, established firms like NHC provide traditional engineering approaches to mapping floodplains. Flood maps by the Fraser Basin Council and the Okanagan Basin Water Board are examples of new collaborative projects with these firms. However, these are expensive, costing millions and taking years to complete. These efforts are not reaching many BC communities. In 2016, 79% of municipalities in BC were either using outdated flood maps or lacked flood maps entirely. Smaller communities, including First Nations, struggle the most with producing new flood maps. With their limited resources, they're often unable to hire conventional consulting firms. Meanwhile, these communities are most vulnerable to the impacts of floods, having fewer resources for recovery. Every dollar a community invests in flood mitigation, 10 can be saved in potential damages. For smaller communities, affordable technical support and flood risk mapping can provide high return on investment. This is where Above Atlantis comes in. Overall, we found that the lack of flood risk communication is the result of three issues. One, existing flood information is scattered between entities, making it difficult to find. Two, the terminology and concepts used for technical flood maps pose a knowledge barrier to the general public. And three, many communities lack the flood maps themselves, as well as the input data required to produce them. And thus, to address the problem landscape, we have categorized the solutions into four services. Data cataloging. We'll develop a centralized resource for users to be directed to existing floodplain data. Data collection. We can collect less data due to the lower input requirements for a flood model. Flood modeling. We'll develop a simpler and more efficient flood model that lowers costs and increases flexibility. And data visualization. We'll prioritize effective intuitive communication of flood information using revised language and 3D visualization. With our solution, we'll address the barriers facing small communities in BC. Our data catalog will address scattered information, our visualizations will make the knowledge and language of floods more accessible, and our efficient data collection and flood modeling methods will fill the lack of data. Ultimately, engage the public in effective flood mitigation. To provide these solutions, we employ a number of technologies. Services like AWS allow for affordable server hosting and control. Consumer drones are inexpensive and can be equipped with cameras and sensors to easily conduct precise remote surveys. The data can be fed into new models like the HAND model, standing for height above nearest drainage. It provides a cheaper and simpler approach that can be paired with machine learning on historic flow data to produce very accurate maps. And finally, software like Blender and Unity can be used to produce dynamic interactive visualizations that create an online experience that can be easily shared and understood. And so for our demonstration, if you'd like to explore it yourself, you can actually go to aboveatlantis.com slash app. And so this here is what the end user will be able to see with our visualization. As you can see, the visualization is fully interactive and dynamic. You can move around, zoom in and out, um, and also, the user is able to uh, dynamically adjust the flood levels. So we have a slider here, and this poses a much better visualization of uh, flood impacts on the community. These visualizations um, can be the output of our flood models, or we can plug into existing flood models and flood maps uh, to provide these visualizations. 
And so our services um, are designed to be packaged independently to market at varying price points, ranging from $5,000 to $50,000. At the lower end, we can provide basic services like map digitization. At the higher end, we'll provide a full suite of services. These price points are intended to be lower than conventional firms. Here's an example how we can partner with a municipality to provide our services. The Union of BC Municipalities administers the Community Preparedness Fund, which is used for investments in flood mitigation and planning. We'll collaborate with the municipality to submit an application for this grant. Um, and once that grant application is approved, we'll receive the first half of our funding to initiate our services for the municipality. And we provide the services. And following the delivery of that service, we'll develop uh, or we'll deliver a final report to the UBCM. We'll then receive the latter half of our funding. This means, to be clear, the municipalities that we provide services for actually do not need to pay for our services and can find funding from other areas. In our first quarter, we'll be focused on developing and verifying our flood model, and our main expenses will be in wages and server costs. In our second quarter, we'll deploy our processes to the cloud and refine our data collection methodology. Here, we'll seek to uh, secure our first clients. Our second quarter revenue will be from our smaller services. Our main expenses will be towards wages, marketing, and hardware rentals. In our third quarter, we'll be preparing a complete solution package to apply to CEPF with clients. During this quarter, we'll also receive our first funding from this grant. The most significant expense will be from marketing since we'll produce our services at a greatly reduced cost to attract their first clients. And in our fourth quarter, we'll be focused on delivering the first of our large projects. Now the costs are more representative of our sustained business model and focused on our client's product and the acquisition of new clients. As we build our reputation and reduce our costs through acquiring our own hardware and automating our tasks, we'll be able to increase our profit margins while simultaneously offering our services at a lower price to customers. So that, this graph here is a cost, revenue, and profit per client. With the initial support from Aquahacking and MyTax, we'll be able to end our first year with a modest net profit of $24,750. Back to the bigger picture. So many communities in BC are at risk of floods. They need our support, and it is above Atlantis's goal to make communities more resilient and empowered in the face of these floods. I encourage you all to check out our website, aboveatlantis.com. So I have a, a question. I'm going to break this down. So you're trying to create flood maps, and you're, you've got some technology where you're going to be putting in new data that you collect. But if I recall from your um, materials, you are also approaching others to secure existing data to help mm -hmm, yeah. you build the flood maps. And so my, OK, if I'm correct, that's what I thought. So explain to me why they would give you that data. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'm jumping because a lot of other organizations have worked very hard, have had to compete and find money to get their own data. Mm -hmm. And explain to me why they would give it to you so you can build a business off that. Mm -hmm. um, so the current situation with data sharing in British Columbia is, yeah, it's a lot of it's closed. A lot of municipalities are like holding on to it because um, like they've received the like funding competitively. Um, but there's a movement right now to work towards establishing an open catalog to some of those data sources. Um, so there's potential in the future that things will be more open. Um, in terms of our business in particular, we um, are planning to be sort of a directory rather than um, like a repository of data. So being like, yes, this data exists and someone over there has it, you can go contact them and pay for it if you want, or if you judge it's too expensive, then you can make it yourself. But like. People don't even know where to start looking. Like they don't even know that the data exists at this point um, for a lot of municipalities and communities. So that's a, that's a very uh, first step that we have to do because we don't want to waste our time like collecting data that already exists, right? So just to lay sort of the ground base, the foundation for this, we're going to be uh, figuring out what data already is out there. And explain to me then one quick question. Walk me through what a citizen, because you talked about the problem with citizens not even knowing that they mm -hmm. live in a flood zone. Presumably, they'd make different decisions if they did. But mm -hmm. walk me through what that looks like at the end. How does a citizen actually find out about this, and what do they do? How? What do you What do you see them doing? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the ways that I anticipate our technology being used. Um, so by seeing these 3D um, visualizations, they may be more motivated to take action. So actually like buy sandbags and invest in um, like flood infrastructure for their properties. Um, those that dashboard can also help with um, planning emergency response or evacuation routes, et cetera, because you can see which roads get flooded first and whatnot. Um, and in terms of engaging the communities, um, because um, we were thinking about reaching out to like volunteer fire departments, because those are the ones that are really responsible for safety in these smaller communities. So um, reaching out to those organizations to be like, here's, here's a tool. Um, they're probably already doing good engagement with that, their community about safety as well. So we're going to explore that channel for distributing our product. It's like you've almost got something that's a little bit less expensive than what's available, but maybe it's good enough. I wonder if I'm right in that. Um, maybe you could, you know, answer that question first, please. Mm -hmm. um, so the hand model, that aspect is definitely along those lines where it's, of course, when you put in lots more data, lots more expenses, smarter people, you're going to get a better model, right? But it takes a lot of money and effort to do that. Um, so the hand model makes it makes the data input cheaper and requires less technical ability to put into place. Um, another advantage it has fundamentally over traditional models is that it's quicker to uh, compute. So if you were to plug in a hand model into some sort of forecasting ability, it could actually be done quickly enough that given, I don't know how, like there's a higher discharge upstream. So you can see that discharge and predict within three hours, there's gonna be a flood down here. Um, but the current flood models take a long time to compute, so it's not possible to run that kind of analysis. We are Team Unite Ag. Our mission is to increase the impact and engagement of agricultural programs and policies that relate to water quality. My name is Luke Trinity. I'm a PhD in computer science at the University of Victoria. I learned about the aqua hacking competition through a presentation in one of my courses. I love and have a deep respect for water that I've developed living by beautiful lakes and rivers over the course of my life. My real passion is using computer science and data to learn about how humans affect the world around us. My partner is Wasim Jawad. Wasim is completing his ma Master's in Management Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Queen's University. Wasim has a huge interest in social impact innovation. He loves the combination of human-centric innovations and technology implementations that can solve big social and environmental problems. That's what led him to aquahacking. Our long-term vision is to partner with policymakers and increase the impact and engagement of policies that relate to water quality. We chose the name Unite Ag because we want to develop meaningful relationships with farmers and agricultural stakeholders, unifying the efforts to protect our water. We are Unite AG, working to reduce stormwater contamination in Canada and beyond. My name is Luke Trinity and my partner is Wasim Jawad. Before I get started, I just want to paint the picture of what is currently happening. Imagine you were at work one day and your job is extremely labor intensive and there are serious risks, including from an economic standpoint. Then somebody comes in and tells you there is a brand new set of rules to follow. They haven't thought through how these rules will be implemented or what the consequences are for you. They aren't doing your kind of work. They don't really know how the rules will affect your day to day. Once every few years, they might ask you to complete a really long survey, but they never listen to your feedback or tell you how things are going. The new rules they are implementing have a major effect on your job day to day. So how frustrating is that? Well, this is the current experience of policy and farming. Here is the current problem. Climate change is increasing the risks of flood and drought, forcing farmers to make really tough decisions. There is a serious nutrient management issue that is currently being addressed inadequately. For example, nitrate levels in the Hulker Valley Aquifer in the North Okanagan are the highest they have ever been, posing a hazard to immunocompromised individuals. Existing policies are not being monitored and implemented in coordination with farmers who are actually working on a daily basis. This has created a fundamental distrust, a breakdown between the key stakeholders government and farmers, which is an issue that needs to change to see the kind of results the policies are aiming for. Today, there are competitors like Excess and Nelson. They have a big part to play in the market. 
but they are using tools like multi-hour, 100 question surveys and focus groups, which are time and, co and cost intensive. Because there is not a strong relationship between the feedback given from farmers and the adjustment to policy, there is still a core distrust. In addition, unlike Unite AG, competitors are not focused specifically on water quality, which reduces confidence of stakeholders. Seeing this opportunity, Luke and I introduced Unite AG. Unite AG key competitive advantage is that we deal with engagement management and we have an effective platform. This allows us to bridge this gap between between farmers and policymakers, and really make the difference in increasing the impact and engagement of policies intended to protect our water. We will now explain what that looks like. 100 question surveys are boring. We needed to find a way of creating something that was more interactive, a way to give farmers real insight on how to do things differently. Our platform is customized to farmers and allows them to work through scenarios to see how they can make a difference while complying with policies. Then we take that information and the relationships with farmers back to policymakers, ensuring increased iterations of positive feedback. Unite AG is positioning ourselves as a research partner to the policymakers, as well as an implementation partner to the farmers. This long-term approach is just not done today and is poised to create a win-win situation for farmers and policymakers. All this means more impact, because if we see improvements on the policies, matched with increased engagement, we are confident we can see an increase in the water quality and improve the sustainability of this invaluable resource. So how do we make money? Well, we go through a very simple process where we outline the variables that are needed. An example of a variable is farmer willingness to use wheat and crop rotation. We have a continued group of stakeholders that we work with for the long term. We build an interactive model based on the variables identified with our stakeholders. The farmer receives a benefit, and then we bring back the outcomes to the policymakers so adjustments can be made. Our model is priced by a variable because we know that the variable's input and the outcomes are related to the effort involved. We charge usually about $3,000 per variable. Any given contract is about 10 variables or more, with an average contract of $30,000. In North America, there are 98 regional agricultural offices. 32 of them are focusing on water quality related policies, meaning they are our target market. In Canada, the environmental consulting industry was worth 2.6 billion last year. 26 million was related to developing new environmental policies and 963 million related to assessment and auditing. But it will take a great team to do this. Here is our team. One of our co-founders is Luke Trenti. He recently began as a PhD student in computer science and uh, at University of Victoria. Previously, he completed his Master of Science at the University of Vermont, where he learned about agricultural concerns related to water quality. The other co-founder is myself, Wasim Jawad. I'm completing my Master's in Management, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship at Queen's University. I have a huge interest in, in social impact innovations, and I bring to the team the business experience. To round it out, because we are so early in stage, we have a group of advisors. Alyssa Farr is our business de development mentor. She has extensive experience with social enterprise businesses and is the CEO and founder of Test Advisor, Dr. Scott Merrill, is a research assistant professor at the University of Vermont. He has a background in ecology and, in the managing, and is the managing director of the social ecology, ecological gaming and simulation lab. Finally, Jean-Paul Shears, the associate director of Center for Business Venturing at Smith School. Together, we believe it will be possible to successfully gain traction and enter the market. Unite AG is currently in the first phase of development. At this stage, we are putting our team together so we have all necessary roles accounted for. We are also working to assemble a network of contacts with agriculture associations. Finally, we are conducting preliminary requirements discussions with agriculture stakeholders. Already we have two potential clients and the money from Aquahacking will allow us to subsidize pilot programs and gain improved 
important market traction. There were so amazing solutions in the, sh in the channel tonight, and each one of them might become a policy or engaged with one in the near future. We are happy to offer our solution to, to Aqua Hacking Network and willing to be part, part, uh, part of solving the water issues. We really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. I have a question. Um, I'm just curious, I'm, I'm not quite clear if the solution you're providing is a consulting service, like you're bringing people together, or do you actually have an online platform uh, that is bringing people together that you've tested with farmers? And... That's a great question. So you're right that we are going to be collaborating and partnering with policymakers. And then the other part of what we're offering as our solution is that engagement management. So we're going to be the ones reaching out to farmers and collecting data, building those relationships. Your customers will be basically the policymakers, those uh, agencies that, that you talked about. Is that correct? They will be the ones paying right. you. Monthly. Right. Okay. And uh, have you uh, have you already started to talk to them, or uh, where are you in that kind of customer validation phase? Yeah, um, great question. We actually, um, thanks to to Aqua Hacking, in our first semi final, we get the attraction from from Ontario uh, Agriculture uh, Ministry, and they contact us through Aqua Hacking, and we have now we started now the the communication with them in the first phase of gathering what their requirements or what the policy they are dealing with now. Um, and we are, we are dealing with a few others opportunity. We are discussing with the policy managers here. And, and if I understand correctly from previous questions and answers, you're not actually building a platform. So uh, you could actually be starting to do that consulting service right now if you wanted to. Is that correct? Or, or you're still building a platform where you can feed in the data and some outcomes will come out? That's a really great, great question. So our platform is, I would say, 90% operational. It's the customization and the tailoring, that, that last 10% where we talk to the policymakers and figure out exactly what they want to be targeting for their feedback. And so we think that um, with the seed money from Aqua Hacking, we could run two to three pilots in the next year. It is a very big issue and, and certainly one that needs that stakeholder involvement though it can be tricky to get the stakeholders engaged what's been your experience so far with with the outreach to, to the community to the farming community in particular that's a really great question and we know that one of the toughest parts of this is a stakeholder engagement because you know oftentimes farmers are resistant to technology or reaching out so we're developing a good network through our contacts um, through different agriculture organizations we believe that our key advantage here is the increased interactivity combined with incentives of our platform. So we're going to make it easier for the farmers, less time consuming, and actually reward them um, in, in multiple ways, you know, both through direct incentives, but also indirect, you know, helping them learn more about policies that affect their day-to-day -day operations. Really great, great question, though. But and to add on that, um, the, the, for, for our now experience with our proof of concept, uh, those clients or users were really familiar or easy to them to interact with those simulators rather than going to Excel sheets or multi questions or numbers. So when they, you are dealing with simulator with something like build up as a, as a scenarios and how to take your decision as if it's a daily, a daily decision, that's really easy for, for them. So uh, what's, what's in it for farmers? Why would they spend their time talking to you? Um, and why will they trust you? Really, really great, great question. And so one of the things that I want to talk about is that this is very futuristic idea, but now really is the time to invest in this area, especially with everything going on with coronavirus. We know that social distancing and reaching out remote is more important now than ever. How are we going to engage the farmers? It's really a twofold approach. The first one is the increased interactivity. So the way that we're going to reach out is very different than a traditional survey. It's more fun. It's interactive. There's, there's elements of chance involved and also through incentives. So we're really going to incentivize, that, incentivize them to participate um, and not just participate, but incentivize them to really think through every decision that they're making. That's part of how our platform works. Wow. What amazing solutions.
Thank you to all the teams and congratulations on the excellent pitches. I know you put a lot of work into these. Now, audience, please enter your vote for your favorite pitch and take part in awarding an extra $1,000 to the team with the most votes. I would now like to welcome back one of our judges, Paul O'Callaghan with his colleague, Aoife Kelleher, to provide us with their insights about water technology and entrepreneurship through a keynote presentation, Brave Blue World, the importance of storytelling and rethinking the water industry. Before we get into the presentation, here is a bit more about their backgrounds. Paul has a very accomplished background with experience in multiple sectors. He volunteered in the NGO sector with the World Wildlife Fund. He has completed a master's degree focusing on the effects of deforestation on water quality, and he's founded Blue Tech Research in 2011 while working as an engineering consultant. Paul's latest project, Brave Blue World, is designed to increase awareness of existing solutions to the water crisis. And he has co-produced a documentary that has attracted support from a host of A-list celebrities. In addition to lecturing at universities across the world, Paul now advises many global Fortune 500 corporations, including L'Oreal, Microsoft, and PepsiCo on their water strategy policies and is currently studying for a PhD in water innovation. Aoife is a water technology research analyst at Blue Tech Research, and she has a diverse background in field, laboratory, and database research within water, hydrology, water technologies, energy, botany, and soil science. In her role as a water technology research analyst, She's currently focused on researching resource recovery, energy, sanitation, and one water technologies. Aoife has a strong background in scientific communications with previous roles at the Global Science Gallery. And she also takes the role of lead researcher and content creator for the Brave Blue World documentary, a water industry collaborative project. Aidan, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to be here speaking to Paul for the Aqua Hacking audience on behalf of the Brave Blue World team. And congratulations to all the five finalists. It's a fantastic achievement to get to today, and uh, we look forward to tracking your continued success. For sure. So, Paul, I've, I've worked with you over the past few years, primarily on the Brave Blue World project, and many people in the water industry know you as the CEO and founder of Blue Tech Research, or the man behind the Brave Blue World documentary. But what was it that initially attracted you to the water industry as a graduate? Well, I always had a strong desire to travel. And um, when I completed my undergraduate degree, I headed to Malaysia and I volunteered with the World Wildlife Fund for a year. And I learned a lot there about the connection between forests and water and the environment and the impact. I was working at Upland Highland Rainforest at the time. Yeah. And that really struck a chord with me. And I then went back to university and took a postgraduate course, a master's degree in water resource management in Edinburgh and Scotland to pursue a vocational career in that area and was fortunate out of that to go and work for what was one of the most progressive companies at the time, the body shop, who were really light years ahead of anybody else in terms of sustainability. And since then, I've, I've never looked back. Amazing. It's, it's interesting how when you start your career, you know, you, you never know fully where you're going to end up, but you've stayed in water. And I think that's a common experience with a lot of people who start their careers early on in water, that they, they tend to stick to that sense of community and, and that feeling. And they very much buy into a number of people from all over the world trying to solve one problem. So many of the individuals competing in the aqua hacking competition are at the beginning of their careers, like myself. Do you have any advice for young professionals in water? And what was it that kept you in the industry for so long? Was it that sense of community? I, I think that sense of community and common purpose is a huge, huge part of it, the sense of mission. I'm a biochemist. And when I completed my undergrad degree, I didn't think I was going to practice biochemistry in water. In fact, I really didn't think about water. And I didn't know there was such a thing as the water industry, the water sector. And many people who happen upon this sector are like that. They may come from finance, information technology, biotechnology, advanced material science, robotics. And they find that there's an outlet where you can have a purpose and a mission, which I think we all seek meaning in our work, in water. And then there's that shared sense of community and collegiality. Although many of the companies we engage with are would-be competitors, at the same time, they know that we're all working towards something, which is a, something unifying a common goal. And I think that does sustain people in the sector for, you know, for a whole career. Absolutely. So from biotechnology 
to water in the body shop and, and then to Blue Tech Research and now finally to Brave Blue World, we were delighted that Aqua Hacking approached us to incorporate a screening of the documentary into this event. So I worked on the Brave Blue World project as well as, as the lead researcher, but maybe Paul, you can explain to the viewers where the idea for the documentary came from as you know, we're both scientists and what were the, the aspirations behind this project initially? Yeah, look, like a lot of things, it was probably, it happened overnight after 10 years. <laughs> um, it had been building for quite a while in my mind from different experiences I'd had. Um, a few years back, I was contacted by the Discovery Channel and they were doing a series on inventions, all sorts of inventions. Mm -hmm. and one episode was on a water technology, supercritical water oxidation. And I jumped in with two feet. I, I knew that they weren't going to knock again. And I loved it. I, I loved the experience and I loved how it appeared later on as a really engaging piece. And I went, wow, you can really make this stuff cool. And, at the, and then as I went through the next few years, I could see all these different stories that I was seeing that were somehow tied together in a common narrative. And I could also see that there was a bit of a gap in people's awareness of water. And I thought that this could be a fabulous medium to reach a large number of people and get them engaged. Absolutely. And you talk about that level of awareness. And when we were traveling for the documentary, going to all these various locations, looking for stories to tell to the public, uh, one of the places that we stopped in was Singapore. And you often use this example of, of the taxi driver analogy to, to talk about the effect that you can have as a country with your general public when you communicate with them effectively about water. Yeah, that was something always struck a chord with me traveling around the world some places have great water challenges but they also achieve incredible things in solving those challenges and when i thought about it i think a real common denominator was people and you know that story is when i hop off the plane in singapore and i get into a cab or an uber and i'm chatting with the driver on the way into my hotel and i tell them why i'm in town and we get chatting and their eyes light up and they start telling me all about water in singapore and how they have new water and they're very proud of that fact and they rattle off statistics that you know, most people would just not be aware of. And I went, wow, how do you get to that level of engagement? And I noticed a similar pattern in places like the Netherlands where they're underwater mm -hmm. or in Israel where they grow food in the desert. Yeah. And I thought if you can get to that place where people get an emotional connection with this, it makes everything easier. And that was really a missing link in getting effective policy, technology and finance to, to all come together. And that was the real motivation for, for a water documentary. Absolutely. So education was really one, to, one of the, the fundamental reasons why you even thought about pursuing a water documentary. And one of the things that we initially spoke about when we were thinking about Brave Blue World was that a lot of these documentaries, you know, provide people with this image of doom and gloom. And they don't necessarily feel like they can be a part of the solution or a part of, you know, positivity within this industry and, and making a change. So that's where our call to actions for different groups of people really came in. And, and that was fundamental in terms of the communications on the project. So Paul, maybe you can speak to people a little bit more about the different calls to action for corporates, utilities and, and young professionals and, and how that initial education and understanding of what the problems are can then lead to action. Yeah, and I think Aoife, you know, you and I both, both know, and I was always, very struck from your early involvement in the project, your awareness of how important it is to be able to communicate science to a general audience and the role that different mediums can have in doing that. And I guess what we learned through the course of this film is people relate to people. And if you can humanize these stories, although they're from different parts of the world, people will, will re relate to it. And then the cause to action might be to think, wow, I, I could make a difference here. Maybe I could have a career in, in water. And they may not have considered that before. And the more people we can get engaged and bring their unique, diverse skill sets and talents to bear on the problem, the better. Um, Absolutely. And one of the things that we talked about was if you're a member of the general public, which I'm sure not of the, the audience here really aren't that, but if you are a member of the general public, one of the things that you can do is you can support brands and support corporates that are sustainably using their water or sustainably managing resources, be it at a catchment level or in terms of integrating water reuse into their systems, you can support those companies economically. And, and that's how you can support environmental causes within a corporate organization. But Paul, maybe you can speak to a little bit more the mission behind trying to get some more young professionals into the water industry and, and what that can potentially add. Well, 
just changing how we think about things. I think if there's one thing we're short of, it's probably new thinking because we're not technology limited and there's a lot of, of the investment community would love to find a way to have an impact in, in addressing water challenges. And I think young professionals in particular, they have the benefit of being you know, somewhat of a tabula rasa. They don't have what we often call the burden of knowledge in that it's hard to forget what you already know and you've been taught. And I think the challenge is to keep an open mind. And we've been doing things a certain way with water for well, thousands of years in, in one sense, and that we've been piping water since the Romans. That was the first water revolution. Um, but for the past 100 years, we've had a very singular type of approach, and that just doesn't really work anymore. So I'd love to think that young professionals can come in and just take a really fresh look at this and say, yeah, that's crazy. Why, why are we doing that? Because a lot of what needs to happen is that type of thinking needs to come to bear. And people in their communities might go, yeah, why aren't we reusing the water? Like, that is such a cool and logical thing to do. And when people embrace it at that level, then it's really powerful. For sure. It's almost like the, the penny drops. Sometimes we maybe overcomplicate things a little bit, but you often speak also about the paradoxes in water. So can you speak about some of the paradoxes that we referenced in the documentary? It's one of the things that's fascinating about water is its paradoxical nature. I think it keeps you engaged in this subject for, for decades. Actually, one of the first people to comment on this was Leonardo da Vinci. He turned out had a real fascination with water and how it could be different things. It would take on the shape of the environment it was in. It could be hard, it could be soft. Um, it could change color depending on where it was. And uh, one of the lines someone said to me when I first got into the sector was, water has no memory. And I never forgot it because I think we think of the fact that we've used water, but really it's all been reused. And why can you take a cup of water to the International Space Station, as we described in the film, and reuse that over and over again? And, and yet we're scarce, we experience scarcity here in our communities when in actual fact it's probably more how we manage water. Absolutely. Is, is challenge. Absolutely. And another one of those paradoxes is you know, the cost of water and, and where you where you live. So why is it that some of the poorest people in the world pay the most for water? And, and that's another topic that we touched on with the, the story with water.org in, in the documentary is, is financing of water. And that's that's a completely different story. Yeah, it, it's absolutely crazy to think that some people in the world where water.org work and some of the communities that we visited in Kenya and India are paying more for water than we're paying and it's less quality. And, and that's just, you know, it's just crazy. It's paradoxical. And what water.org are doing, they're trying to unlock that paradox and create ways that people can find new ways, innovative ways of being able to bring that power back to themselves, have access to water, and thereby get on with, you know, living their lives and having fruitful, productive lives. For sure. And as a young person, it can often feel overwhelming, but also motivating that there are lots of problems to solve in the industry in terms of rethinking and, and innovation and business models and whatnot. But this this audience is majority young professionals or, or people who are earlier on in their careers in water. What advice would you give to any younger startups relating to innovation in the industry? I think think differently. Understand that there is a global water crisis that it's only going to get worse as climate change effects are exacerbated and that no matter where you are in the world you will likely experience it in some way shape or form in in, in the next you know, number of decades but you can be part of the solution and that's probably the exciting thing i think um, and it's something that we don't relate to maybe as clearly as we should. One of the things that struck me when I went to Kenya, and you mentioned water.org and the paradoxes there, was I've been in the water sector for 20 years. And I don't think I really fully appreciated what it was like to not have access to clean water and sanitation until I went and I visited kids living in orphanages where they didn't have access to water and the difference that it made to their lives when they did. And it's strange to say that, you know, you have to almost see it to really experience it. And I think, We've seen that coming home to roost, though, in communities like Flint, Michigan, in the United States. So it's not as far away as we think. And just understanding that it's hyper-local, global, and you can make a difference. 
Absolutely. And I think that make a difference message is, is something that we wanted to get across really clearly in the documentary. And it's also a nice note for us to end on here. So thank you so much, Paul, for your time and, and thank you to the audience and for inviting us here. We hope you all had a chance to watch the Bravely World documentary and make sure to look out for our podcast, which features interviews with Biospherians, astronauts and Mr. Toilet, to name a few. And finally, we would like to say good luck to all of the finalists competing in the competition. We have no doubt that you will go ahead to have tremendously successful careers in the water industry. So thank you and bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Eva. for months on their solutions, business plans, and pitches. But first, before we find out who the judges selected, let's find out who you, the public, have chosen for the extra $1,000 cash prize. And the public choice prize goes to, congratulations, Team Elite, and thank you to all the members of the public who voted. Now, to the final prizes for all the teams, and a reminder that all these teams are eligible to apply for the matching funds through our partner My Tax program to at least double their prize money. We're going to start with the fifth place team, winner of $2,500 and a spot in a business incubator. I'd like to welcome back Meryl Ann Fair to announce the winner of fifth place. Hi everyone. I'm really happy to be starting off the awards. And so how about if we get going? The award for fifth place and the BC Aqua Hacking Challenge 2020 goes to Unite AG. Yay, Unite AG. Excellent job, Wasim and Luke. The judges would like to share with you three pieces of advice. I'd really like to see your project make it to market. So here's our three thoughts. One, we know you're tackling a really big issue in the policy realm, which is different. We really think you should consider getting a partner quickly and doing a get your first survey done, a statistically significant survey. You can use it to show your proof of concept, really important. Second, we think you should consider an ongoing revenue model. First, it allows you to develop relationships with your customers, maintain them, but to use an agricultural approach to this, you've got a great germ of an idea, but you need to grow it and it needs to become sustainable. And that form of revenue model will help you do that. The third idea is that maybe you should consider thinking of your relationship between the policymakers and the farmers and your role in it is a circular flow of information. So not only are you working with farmers to get their information to policymakers, but you're actually working with policymakers to get their information to farmers and doing it as a circular, more of a circular flow so that it'll help you build trust both ways. And then there's something in it for both ends of your spectrum of people you're dealing with. Hope you find that information useful. And once again, congratulations. Great job. Team Unite AG, congratulations. Is there anything you'd like to share? My advisors, Dr. Hazna Jabari and Ulrika Steej, as well as our advisors and mentors, of which we've had many, including Alyssa Farr, Marta Green, and Scott Merrill. We want to thank everyone at Aqua Hacking and Water Lucian, Carolina, Melissa, and Anne Pascal, especially. And then also the great and really um, extremely smart people that we've met over at the Okanagan Basin Water Board, um, especially James and Anna, who have talked to us, and we're really excited to continue the discussion with you. And then finally, um, we would like to thank Queen's Management Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. Now to announce the fourth place team, winner of $2,500 and a spot in a business incubator, is a member of the Aqua Hacking team, Carrie Ann Arrow. Thanks, Aiden. Hi, everybody. It was so great to be able to hear all the teams pitch, and I'm really happy to be with you now to announce the fourth place winner, which is Team Elite. Congratulations, guys. The judges really liked your creative idea of a new type of filter media. 
the recommendations they had for you were to look at the health and safety aspects of sanitizing the hair. They were concerned there's a lot of surface area to hair and they thought you should look at maybe some other options. They recommended also doing some research into industries that rely on collecting waste material from people. That can be very expensive and quite time consuming. And their third recommendation was for you to consider working with Team GAPS. You're both working on very complementary ideas and maybe something fruitful can come from collaborating. Anyway, congratulations and best of luck to you all. Now to announce the third place team, winner of $10,000 and a spot in a business incubator is James Litley of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. Hello everyone. Thanks Aiden. Happy to be joining you from Kelowna. The team getting the third place in this competition is Team Above Atlantis. Congratulations. As with all the teams, the judges wanted to provide you with some feedback. They wanted you to know that the problem you're trying to address is very important and they liked your proposed approach. They think that you should consider limiting your minimum viable product to begin with and look to expand in the future. Your current market offering proposal is going to take a lot of capital and human resources to get going. So think about how you can start small and build up. They would also like to see you do more research on data availability and data sharing agreements as this is particularly a complex issue with a lot of barriers. Finally, in your valuation, you had 30% of your money going to marketing. The judges think you should shrink this percentage and put more into product development and sales. Once again, congratulations team above Atlantis. We look forward to seeing the development of your solution and your business. Now, Team Above Atlantis, congratulations. Is there anything you'd like to share? Now, to announce the second place team, winner of $15,000 and a spot in a business incubator is Ragwa Gopal. Hello everyone. This is very exciting. So, are we ready for the second place award? Here we go. The team to go back home with the second place award of the BC Equal Hacking Challenge 2020 is Team Gaps. Congratulations and well done. Before you say something, I'd like to take the time to share some comments that we had for you. We like your system and your idea about data gathering. We suggest you really look at who the purchaser of the data would be. Is it the health authorities, the local governments, the provincial ministries? If you're going to target private purchases, focus on jurisdictions where there is a regulatory requirement for this type of technology, so that it is presenting a solution that the customers are required to implement. Once this customer base is built, you'll be able to expand into other markets. Finally, we think you should do some more research into existing competing technologies and your cost comparisons, and consider partnering with Team Elite, as you might be able to offer an even more effective solution by combining ideas. Once again, congratulations. Congratulations, Team Gaps. Is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the award and the opportunity. It's just an incredible feeling. Um, as many of you know, we, uh, 
we started that's actually in a course. It started as a course project. So it was five months ago. If you if you asked, if you told us that we were going to be in this position, walking out of here with one of the top prizes, you know, we wouldn't have believed you. But uh, we put in a lot of hard work. I'm extremely proud of my teammates. Um, and then just a big thanks to to everyone that's contributed along the way. Uh, our professor, um, Sabine Weyand, um, and every one of the Aqua Hacking team, Carolina and Pascal, Melissa, you guys have been a big help. Um, our mentors at Purple, Debbie Reimer, that was, we've had some awesome work with you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just everyone along the way. It's been it's been such a great journey, and we look forward to continue. Thanks. Now, to help us learn more about the winner of the competition with an award of twenty thousand dollars, is Paul O'Callaghan. Hello from Ireland, and I am delighted and honoured to be awarding the winning team today. At this point, you've all guessed who that is, so please join me in congratulating Team O Zero. We were very impressed with the fact that you've already sought feedback from the Ministry of the Environment. We also suggest consider expanding your market to not include not just municipalities, but also possibly individual boat owners and exploring a pay as you go type of business model. We think it's fantastic that you're using the support of the province of Quebec and working with Quebec municipalities. It would also be good to focus on provinces where this is already a problem. For example, in Manitoba, where some lakes are infested and some are not. And indeed, looking right across North America, where these issues occur, in terms of your team, we believe you'd benefit from adding a marketing professional to the team as well. So congratulations, Team O'Zero, and congratulations to all of our finalists. Team O'Zero, congratulations on winning the challenge. Is there anything that you'd like to share? Yes. Uh, first of all, I think we can all agree that uh, the Aqua Hacking Challenge was one hell of a journey. Uh, along the way, a lot of people helped us to develop our business model, but also they give us the energy to bring our project to the next level. Uh, we just all want to shout out the, all the Aqua Hacking team. Uh, our mentor, uh, Julian from uh, Rice Kombucha. By the way, you just uh, win your bet. And okay. our mentor from the University of uh, Sherbrooke, Jacques Petit. I think uh, we all uh, we are all uh, really grateful of uh, what's happening to us right now. So thank you very much. Thank you all, and again, congratulations to all the competitors. I will now ask James Litley, the Okanagan Basin Water Board's Aqua Hacking Project Manager, to close the event. Thank you, Aiden, both for your work today as MC and also for your leadership as an Aquahacking co-founder and for being a champion for freshwater issues through your Aquahacking podcast. We're really grateful that you could join us today. Congratulations again to all of the teams. While today marks the end of the competition portion of the 2020 Aquahacking Challenge in British Columbia, it is just the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey for the teams. Each of the five winning teams will continue to be supported through their business development journey and we look forward to seeing your creative solutions brought to market in the next few months and to see your companies grow over the next few years. I would like to again thank our judges who volunteered their times to provide valuable feedback to each of the teams. I hope the teams will take the advice to heart as I'm sure it will help you on your journey. I would like to again recognize and thank the Gaspé Bobien Foundation, the RBC Foundation, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, Tech Resources, Ovivo, MyTax, Lavery Lawyers, IBM, and TELUS, and our implementation partners, Okanagan Waterwise, Aquaforum, Hackworks, Waterlution, and Purple. Your generous support has made this Aqua Hacking Challenge possible. I would also like to recognize the contributions of our advisory committee who have been volunteering their time since June 2019 and have provided great advice and guidance to make this challenge a success. As we started planning for this Aqua Hacking Challenge back in June of 2019, no one knew that by the final we would be unable to host in-person events and would need to bring people together from across the country and around the world on remote platforms using technology. A lot of work has to go in behind the scenes to make this happen, and I'd like to recognize the production team at TKNL in Montreal for bringing all this together in such a seamless format. Finally, I'd like to recognize the hard work of our team here at the Okanagan Basin Water Board. 
especially Carolina Restrepo and Corinne Jackson, and the team at Aquaform in Montreal and Victoria, Anne Pascal Richardson, Melissa Dick, Laurence Basso, and Carrie Ann Arup. I look forward to working with all of you again, hopefully in the near future in another BC Aqua Hacking Challenge. So once again, thank you to everyone for joining us and congratulations to all of the teams. I now declare the 2020 Aqua Hacking Challenge in British Columbia closed.